As you now know, I'm a senior technical editor and writer, and my name is Ingrid Towie, and I work for Red Hat. If you're in this talk, how to edit other people's content without pissing them off, you want your writers to not look like this <laughs> when you edit their content. You want them to be happy with you, am I right? Well, the way I started doing this talk was I began to realize that people talk to me a lot and they say things like, Ingrid, I wish we could clone you. Ingrid, you're such a good editor. Ingrid, I love the way you preserve people's voice and how you're so diplomatic when you edit. And I'm like, okay, I'm a little embarrassed to recount this to all of you because it's like I'm t saying nice things about myself. But I kept thinking, I've been a working person a long time and I don't remember actually getting these kind of comments in my past working life. What, what's changed about me? And I thought, oh, I think I know what happened. I think I know why I'm better at this than I used to be. You see, once upon a time, a long time ago, it was the early 90s, <laughs> I was a high-powered technical writer, usability specialist. I was actually a UX user experience person before the term UX was invented. And, you know, I thought I looked really cute in this suit. <laughs> you know, the, the padded shoulders, they were a thing. And I liked my dangly earrings. But I said, you know, I had to give it all up. I gave up the cute suits. I gave up the colorful lapels and the padded shoulders. And I did that so that I could homeschool my kids for 15 years. And I know it was hard, probably the hardest thing to give up was the paycheck, even more than the prestige. But what I got in turn was lots and lots of days like this, with all three kids reading on my lap. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is really a pretty typical day, at least in my homeschool. We spent, we, we um, did a lot of field trips, earned a lot of Junior Ranger badges. This is actually at a national park in um, Arizona. We even built our own full-size catapult because every neighborhood needs a friendly neighborhood war engine, right? <laughs> And the funny thing about this was I became a better writer and editor than I had ever been before. Now, how, how did that happen? Well, if you love something, set it free. That's a corny old saying, right? If you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it was yours. If it doesn't, you need to hunt it down and kill it, right? <laughs> well, no, it never was. That's, that's actually the way it's supposed to end. What I did was I actually gave up my career and I got it back better than ever before because one of the things I began to realize was when you're working with a kid and you're teaching that child how to write, you're teaching them their math facts, you're editing their papers, you gotta still tuck them into bed at night. You can't just throw the edits over the wall and hope it's okay. If they run out into the yard, in the backyard, and refuse to come back in and homeschool with you, true story, um, you can't just shrug it off. And so I had to learn how to be diplomatic while also being effective. I began to crystallize what I, I realize now are four principles I've crystallized for you. Um, although I think I was doing this more unconsciously and I had to really think about it to prepare my, my um, proposal and to prepare this talk. When you're editing, when you're doing a peer review, when you're working with other writers, or uh, if you're an engineer, when you're working with your editors and writers, you have to realize that you're all on the same side. It's not an us versus them scenario. Number two, Remember, it's edit, not edict. An edit is not a command. Explain why you make an edit so that people understand why they, you sh they should make the changes. Get help. 
You don't have to do it by yourself. Those are important things to realize. So let's go to principle one. We're all on the same side. Now, whose side is that? That's right, the customer's side. Don't argue with the rider over whether it's a six or a nine. Get on the same side as the customer and explain it from that viewpoint. I had this experience with my child recently. Mom, I agreed to read a friend's paper and edit it and it's just very bad. The writing is so clumsy and repetitive. How do you do this? Okay, it was really nice for her to actually be living my pain. That was great. Um, but I, I, you know, I didn't say, oh yay. I said, no, think about what she's trying to say. Think about who her audience is because every time you're writing, you're writing for someone. We all know that. But sometimes we get so bogged down in the technical details that we forget it. Keep that in your forefront, especially when you're editing and doing peer reviews. Think about the point she is trying to make and help her. So that means you're gonna have to really lean into your empathy and your patience. And you're gonna have to always be realizing that the customer, the person that you're writing for, your audience, they're right. What you want is not necessarily what's important. What's important is what your reader wants. I come from a, long, from a family where we did a lot of um, retail work. My dad and my mom owned their own business, and so I was always running the cash register, cutting fabric, selling things, and customer is always right. Well, it's true no matter what your job is. Now, I'm gonna take a few minutes and just talk about what things are true for all customers, whether they're your customers or my customers. And when I'm talking about customers, I'm talking about people reading our online content. And I'd say easily most of you here probably write for online. Even if you write for print, a lot of the habits that online readers are developing have now moved over into print. So those, these are important lessons to know just that are true for all customers. Let's start with some statistics. When somebody does a Google search or some other kind of search and they come to your content, you have on average 10 seconds before they push the back button and say, the information I want is not here. Some studies actually say it's as short as eight seconds. A few studies recently have said it might only be two or three seconds. People form an opinion of your site in 50 milliseconds. Now, how long is that really? One twentieth of a second. It's an eye blink. Some more statistics. You have 59 seconds if your site is trusted. Now, Red Hat, our site is trusted. People come to it because they expect an answer there. So maybe we have almost a whole minute before they push the back button. Maybe not. And once they're there, they only read about 28% of the page content, if you can believe that. So what does that tell us? Customers these days, they scan, they don't read. And this has been always true of documentation. Customers' number one priority is to read, what's, what their, read your content, find an answer, and get back to work. The fact that they've gone to your documentation at all is an admission of failure. It's not just a distraction. It means that something is so bad that they can't keep going without looking it up. The other thing you have to think about is what's unique to your customers, to your audience. At Red Hat, we write a lot of things for systems administrators, developers, occasionally a less technical audience like business analysts, but to be honest, a lot of our audience is very technical. That, by the way, I'll just go back, that's a data center at Google. So here's a typical systems diagram from one of our products called Satellite. Our diagram designer had this brilliant idea of why don't we take this diagram and 
not just this one, but similar ones too, and animate it. Wouldn't that be cool? We can start with this little square at the top, and then as the satellite sends out patches and different kinds of security updates to the capsules, we'll let that animation show up and we'll kind of let each capsule display one at a time. She did that, she animated it, she showed it to, oh, a lot of people at Red Hat, technical people, non-technical people, um, other writers, solutions architects, they all loved it. The salespeople loved it. She did usability testing with systems administrators and every single one of them hated it. And you know why that is? They wanted to see the whole picture all at once so they could load it into their minds to do their work. They are model-based thinkers. That was an important piece of information that she found out by usability testing and understanding our unique audience. And your audience isn't unique in some way too. So principle one is we're all on the same side. Now whose side is that? That's right, the customer side. Principle two is it's edit, not edict. It's not a command. You're not playing a tennis match where you're opposing side. You know, and when you're homeschooling, you can't do that either. It's not mom and dad versus the kids. No, no. It's not writers, engineers versus the editor. We're all on it working together. Now when you're homeschooling, if you're a parent, if you know a parent, if you've had a parent, you've heard the term, pick your battles. No, no, you pick too many battles, put that one down. That's really something you've got to do when you're writing. Now think about it, if your kid dyes her hair purple, it's going to grow out. Well, the same is true when you're editing. You don't have to fix every single comma, and you don't have to fix something just because you like it better that way. There is no passion in the world equal to the passion to edit someone else's content. <laughs> Notice the blood. Don't give in to that passion. Let it go, just like you let the bird go in the earlier slide. And, you know, it's fine. You don't need to have everybody do it your way. That's not what editing's about. Make your edits reversible. I actually have a writer I work with who didn't want to work with me at first because she said, I hate working with editors. The editor that I used to work with, she insisted on editing my source, my latest copy, and she would make changes and she didn't always understand the technical content and she would make things technically wrong. Don't be that kind of person where somebody is telling stories about you years later. Come on, you don't need that. Now, I actually work like that. I can't know, no, I don't work like in the sense, I'm not that kind of editor, but <laughs> I work with a lot of products where I don't know the technical details. I can't. There are 124 writers in my writing group at Red Hat, and I'm the single editor, one, that's me, just one person. So I could be, or I could be editing API documentation one day, I could be editing something for business analysts the next day. I could be opening, editing OpenStack one day. Today is Monday. It is Monday, isn't it? I guess I'm editing OpenShift today. <laughs> editing should be a collaborative conversation. It's all about collaborating for the best outcome for your audience. I'm going to show you an example of that kind of collaborative uh, experience. I was working with a writer here called Roger, and he had a section that he had titled Emulator Threads. Heck, I didn't even know what an emulator thread was. Eventually, after some research and reading the rest of his document, I said, oh, okay, this is really about the task, pinning emulator threads. But why would you want to do that? 
What does pinning emulator threads do for the customer? Why? Turns out, if you pin the emulator threads, the VM actually has better performance. That's something that a customer can care about, am I right? So we changed the heading on that section, pinning emulator threads to increase performance. If your customer is scanning, not reading, you've got a heading that somebody is likely to stop and look at. That's the kind of editing that you need to be doing yourself. It's the kind of editing we all should be doing because it's helpful. And it actually is on the customer's side. So I said to Roger, yeah, that works. That was a really good way to change the content so that it was understandable. So principle one is, we're all on the same side. Now whose side? Yes. Principle two, does anybody remember what principle two is? That's right, it's not a command. Principle three is explain why you did it. When I was homeschooling, I hated doing math drills because my kids would want to fight with me about it. Then we discovered that they couldn't whine and wheedle with a math drill if it was on a computer. <laughs> and if Dr. Zero, if they couldn't beat Dr. Zero, who would just erase all of everything they'd done up till then, then they couldn't win the game. It was great. I got to be their advocate against Dr. Zero instead of their enemy with a stopwatch. So they did eventually all learn their times tables. My youngest is actually a, a math major. So it worked. Appeal to objective authorities. Appeal to, pe you know, it's actually not the word I was meaning to use. Rely on objective authorities to give your writers evidence for why you want to do something. I really recommend, if you're not familiar with them already, readability tests. I'm sure that most of you have style guides. If you don't, go out and get one. Writing standards, usability testing. These are all techniques you can use that are objective and neutral. They can give you evidence to, for why the suggestion that you've made is a good one. So let's talk a little bit about readability tests. There are two types of kinds of scores you get during readability tests. You can get something that's like a grade level, and I'll talk about that a little more. And you'll also get a score sometimes of like zero to 100, where 100 is very, very easy to read, and zero is like, most people aren't gonna be able to understand this at all. So let's talk a little bit for, about grade levels. So one of the really popular readability tests is the flesh Kincaid and it has grade levels like this. Zero to two is basically grades zero, like kindergarten, to second grade. These are early basal readers like Dick and Jane, those kinds of books. Grades three to six are longer books, but still relatively easy to read. Things like, if you're a parent and are familiar with the Magic Treehouse books, most of them fall into this category. Grades seven to nine are Harry Potter and similar books. I think To Kill a Mockingbird might fit in there too. Grades 10 through 12, we're talking about high school if you're in the United States. More complex novels, Jurassic Park, Pride and Prejudice. 13 and up, college textbooks, academic papers. 16, a score of 16 means that it's readable by a college graduate. So here's an example of a before, of something that um, I actually, this is actually real content that I edited. Let's see, I'm gonna have to take a deep breath. <gasps> okay. Eclipse J currently supports two different configurations. In the single OpenShift project case, workspace objects are created using a service account that can be configured for Chase Server, whereas in the multi OpenShift project case, workspace objects are created on behalf of each OpenShift user as they use Eclipse J. <laughs> Grade level 24.7. 
So um, maybe if you have a PhD, you might be able to read this. Maybe not. Flesh reading E's on a scale of 0 to 100, 7.3. We're talking not an F, not an F minus, an F minus, 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 minus. After, this is what I did. Eclipse J currently supports two different configurations. I put the two different configurations as bullets, single open shift project case, multi open shift project case. I broke that single sentence into essentially three sentences with bullets. New readability score? 9.3. Freshman in high school, yes. And um, on the 0 to 100 score, it came out at about 43%. It's pretty good. If you don't already use readability tests, you can get something called readable.io. It's a website and it costs a little bit of money. It's a subscription that Red Hat is kind enough to pay for for me. If you want to do one that's free, you can use Hemingway Editor. Uh, Microsoft Word does reading, uh, readability testing and scoring in its um, in its uh, statistics, I think that's where it is these days. And Acrolinks is an expensive enterprise-wide version of it that I think IBM uses. Some companies will not submit your content for translation if Acrolinks says it's not ready. Style guides, IBM Style Guide, Microsoft Writing Style Guide, Google Developer Documentation Style Guide. There are, all, there are free versions of all of these out there. If you don't have a style guide, get one and use one and be consistent with it. Writing standards, global English, minimalism. If you don't know what minimalism is, look it up and um, online you should be able to find some good articles about it. Data guidelines, if you're doing modular documentation, all of these are very useful for doing editing and for telling people why your edit is important. Usability testing, just like I did with that diagram. You can do something as simple as sitting at a conference table and having, the right, having someone actually look at your instructions and try to do the task while they read your instructions. You can go to the Nielsen Norman Group, to their website, and look at their articles and classes. You can go to user interface engineering site, UIE.com. Those are all helpful usability testing, for usability testing, excuse me. <clears throat> so we're on our last principle, principle four. Principle one, we're all on the same side. Principle two, it's edit, not? Yes. Principle three, explain. Why? Principle four, get help. You don't have to do it by yourself. I didn't homeschool alone. I had co-op groups. I had my husband. I had other moms. When I was teaching Hamlet, because I taught Shakespeare classes, uh, and we were doing performances, <laughs> we did it as a group, because my three kids couldn't put on Hamlet. This is the scene between Hamlet and Laertes, where they're having their final battle, their final fight scene, and spoilers, everybody dies. <laughs> kind of like Game of Thrones. <laughs> so get help, and if you're gonna do, I really recommend editing in a peer review sort of group, group editing. So schedule a meeting, and when you do that kind of meeting, review the content in advance. These are my general guidelines for that. Try to focus on only a few items because it's very easy to get sidetracked into something that's not important and then to not be actually focusing on the important part of the content. But you need to agree on those in advance. Say you're gonna focus on headings. You're gonna focus on whether or not um, the stuff, the content is customer focused. Those are the kinds of things you should be looking at instead of whether or not the commas are right. Have clear writing principles that your group agrees on before you get started. Be kind. Across cultural barriers, different countries, this can be hard, but always be kind. At Toastmasters, we talk about give positive feedback, give negative feedback, give positive feedback, make a sandwich, sandwich feedback. Well, some people call this a shit sandwich. <laughs> but I still think it's a useful concept because there's probably something good in the content that will help make somebody more receptive to what you have to say. 
And you also don't want them to stop doing the thing that they're doing correctly because nobody commented on it. Rules for the meeting, have a meeting leader. Because honestly, if I'm in charge, I'm gonna, if I'm not in charge, this is the, the key, if I'm not in charge, I'm gonna talk a lot. And you basically need a meeting leader to shut down people like me. Stick to the agenda. See, make sure no one dominates. Get everyone involved. Sometimes the quietest, shyest person in the room is the one that has the best thing to say. Sometimes you gotta even call on people. I hate to do that, but it's worth it. Focus on the principles, not the writer. Edit other people's writing so that they want to make your changes. They have to trust you. They have to trust that you care about them, that you have something good to say, that you know what you're talking about. It's all about relationships. When I homeschooled, that was the single most important lesson I taught. That was building my relationship with my children. It was the foundation on which we built everything else. And you know, believe it or not, they're adults now and we still get along. I, yay! I worry about that. The same is true of your writers. They've gotta trust you, you've gotta work with them, they've gotta to want to work with you. This is the kind of happy face you want your writers to have, am I right? Because if they trust you and you work together, then this is the kind of happiness that everybody will have. Now, one of my writers said, well, teach me, I, your talk is gonna teach me how to take feedback better, right? I'm, well, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, but I'm gonna say, follow the same principles if you're getting feedback. Assume positive intent care about the person that you're working with, then everybody wins. Thank you.